And it was amazing, amazing to see a beautiful sword like this. The Crusades were one of the craziest times in history. Huge armies marching halfway across the world in search of strange relics and looking to conquer ancient lands. Things certainly were very contentious back in those days, and a lot of valuable treasure was found, transported, and often lost along the way, these guys. Not to mention all the amazing castles that were being built by the various protagonists. Let's check out some of these amazing historical items. We're looking at everything from John the Baptist's head to the actual cross itself in 20 Crusader artifacts that blew archaeologists' minds. <sighs> Number 20, John the Baptist. Over the years, the head of John the Baptist has been one of the most coveted pieces of Christian history. People think that the Jewish teacher and prophet, who is known as one of the first Christian saints, paved the way for his relative, Jesus, whom John baptized in the Jordan River. All four of the New Testament's official gospels and the Jewish writer Josephus agree that John the Baptist was on the orders of a local ruler before Jesus was crucified. The gospels say that the king cut off his head and put it on a plate, but no one says anything about what happened to John the Baptist's body or head afterwards. On the other hand, people who hunt for relics have been trying to figure out what happened to John the Baptist's head for hundreds of years. According to different stories, at least four places claim to possess the head of the saint. Also, museums and churches in Istanbul, Egypt, and Montenegro, among other places, claim that they have other parts of John the Baptist's body, such as his right arm and right hand, which he used to baptize Jesus. In 2010, Bulgarian archaeologists reported that they had found a reliquary with a number of bones in the remains of a medieval monastery on St. John, a Black Sea island off Bulgaria's southern coast. Researchers thought these were probably the remains of St. John the Baptist because a later church on the island was dedicated to him. So how about hitting like and subscribe? Otherwise, a crusader army might just be laying siege to your town, coming for your head. Number 19, the True Cross. The so-called True Cross has probably caused more trouble and than any other object. Legends say that the True Cross is a piece of the cross of Golgotha that is made of gold and filled with very valuable gems. The story of the True Cross starts in the year 326, when the mother of Constantine I, the Empress Helena, is said to have found it. Christians held it until 1187, when the Muslim hero Saladin took it during the Battle of Hattin. People think that after Saladin won the Battle of Hattin and took over Jerusalem, he rode his horse through the city with the holy relic dangling from the horse's tail. Even though Richard I tried hard to capture it during the Third Crusade, the Muslims kept hold of the True Cross. The beam itself disappeared, but pieces of the cross that were broken off were saved and brought back to Europe after the Crusades. Many of the pieces were likely fakes. In fact, if all the so-called pieces of the true cross were put back together, they would make hundreds of crosses. In any case, most experts think that no real parts of the relic remain today. Number 18, the Mandilion of Edessa. The Mandilion or Mandilion of Edessa is a mythical treasure that was said to have a miraculous image of Jesus Christ's face on it. It was also called the Mandelion, which is an ancient Greek word that means little napkin. This word has never been used or found in any other context. Tradition says that the object was made when Jesus put the cloth on his face, leaving an image of his features on the cloth. It's also played an important role in the history of Christian art and worship. The Mandelion of Edessa has been talked about and argued about a lot over the years. It is said that the Mandelion of Edessa was worshipped in the Byzantine Empire up until the 10th century when suddenly it was no longer mentioned in history books. It is thought that it was taken from Edessa to Constantinople in the 10th century. It was lost in the 12th century when Constantinople was destroyed during the Fourth Crusade. It was later found again in the Saint Chapelle of Paris during the time of Louis IX of France, just before 1270. But it was lost again after the French Revolution, and now we have no idea where it is, or if it ever really existed at all. Number 17, Crown of Thorns. Between the 4th and 10th centuries, many of the treasures from Jerusalem were moved to the Byzantine Empire. From there, they were moved back to a safer place, Paris, then the capital of the biggest Christian superpower. The Crown of Thorns was brought to Paris on August 19th, 1239. 
King Louis, a religious man who would later be named Saint Louis of France, took off his crown and royal robes to walk barefoot behind the relic as it was brought to the unfinished Saint Chapelle, the Church of the French Kings. When it was completed in 1248, Louis's collection of relics, of which the crown was the most important, was stored in that church. There is a stained glass window called Relics of the Passion in the church still to this day. Several of the crown's thorns were taken off while it was in the Saint Chapelle and given as gifts by the French kings to important people of the time. During the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century, many of the church's relics and riches were lost. But Napoleon saved the crown of thorns and it was kept at the National Library until 1804. In 1806, it was moved to the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris. By this time, all of the crown's natural thorns had been lost. It is now a bunch of reeds held together by gold wire to represent the thorns that have disappeared. Number 16, Secro Catino. The search for the Holy Grail has been going on for a very long time. Great leaders and nations have tried to find the cup, which is said to have magical powers that can cure illness and give people endless life. You might know this from the Indiana Jones movies. Over the years, many things that claim to be the real grail have been put forward. But the truth is, no one is sure which is the real cup. The Sacro Catino is one such contender. It's not clear where this beautiful cup came from, but it's now treasury museum of the Cathedral of San Lorenzo in Genoa, Italy. The dish is said to have been found during the Crusades. It seems to have been made from a single, very large emerald, and it appears to generate its own light. Spooky. In the first few years of the 12th century, the cup found its way to Genoa. It is said that it was taken during the sacking of Caesarea in 1101 after the First Crusade. A dish this beautiful and valuable could only have come from Jesus' table, right? The Sacro Catino is a cup that looks like it was made in Roman times. It has six sides. This cup is about nine centimeters tall and 33 centimeters wide. The Genoese put the bowl on display as a prize and said that it could work miracles. Legends began to grow around the bowl. And in the 1290s, Jacobus de Vorgine wrote in his book, Chronicon, that Sacro Catino was the real Holy Grail. Napoleon took this bowl with him to Paris during his conquering of Italy. On the way to Paris, one of Napoleon's men dropped the bowl, which broke into pieces. Wow, that must have been embarrassing. What about her fingers? It was sent back to Genoa in 1816, but by then the damage had already been done. Number 15, Ancient Crusader Sword. In 2021, an Israeli diving swimmer found an old sword off the country's Mediterranean coast. Experts think the sword is from the time of the Crusaders. Shlomi Katzen was doing a weekend diving dive off the coast of Israel's Carmel, south of Haifa, when he found a sword and other articles, artifacts, on the bottom. The artifacts included stone and metal anchors, pieces of broken pottery, and the sword. Sword experts think that the weapon is about 900 years old. It seems that changing sands brought to light the riches that had been hidden on the seafloor. Along this part of the coast, there are a lot of natural coves where ships have taken cover from storms and sometimes left behind troves of historical treasure. Katzen was afraid that the organism-covered sword would be stolen or buried again, so he brought it to the beach and told the official artifacts body, which protects such finds. The sword, which has been kept in perfect shape and looks like it belonged to a crusader knight, is a beautiful and rare find. Number 14, Trove of Coins. Israel is, of course, a country full of ancient artifacts that are just waiting to be found. There's plenty from the Crusades in particular. This time, Israeli researchers found rare gold coins and a gold earring from 900 years ago at the site of a Crusader massacre. A small copper pot with 24 gold coins and an earring was found hidden between two stones on the site of a well in the ruins of a 900-year-old house. The pot was found between two stones on the side of the wall. Since the coins in the cache are from the end of the 11th century, they can be linked to the Crusader capture of the city in 1101. This was one of the most important events in the city's history. According to experts, most of the people who lived in Caesarea were killed by a Crusader army led by King Baldwin I of Jerusalem. The amazing items were found near a holy site that King Herod the Great built more than 2,000 years prior. Nearby, people have also found other valuable things. In the 1960s, a pot with gold and silver jewelry in it was found in Caesarea. In the 1990s, a collection of bronze dishes was also uncovered. Who knows what'll be found out there next? 
Number 13. The Tomb of Lazarus The Tomb of Lazarus is a popular place of pilgrimage. It is in the West Bank town of El Aizaria, which is often thought to be the biblical village of Bethany. It's on the southeast side of the Mount of Olives, about 1.5 miles east of Jerusalem. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is said to have performed a very special miracle when he brought Lazarus back from the This miracle is said to have happened at his tomb. Since at least the 4th century AD, Christians and Muslims have believed that the spot is the tomb described in the Gospel. Archaeologists have found that the area was used as a graveyard in the 1st century AD. There have been several Christian churches there over the years. The Al-Uzair Mosque has also been on the site of the tomb since the 1600s. The Franciscan Order built the nearby Roman Catholic Church of St. Lazarus between 1952 and 1955 on the site of several older churches. Just to the west of the tomb, a Greek Orthodox church was built in 1965. So this place is like a magnet for churches and mosques. It must be pretty special. Number 12. The Temple Church One of London's oldest and most beautiful churches is the Temple Church. The Knights Templar built the church. They were an order of crusading monks that was founded in the 12th century to protect travelers going to and from Jerusalem. The round and the chancel are the two different parts of the church. In 1185, the Patriarch of Jerusalem blessed the Round Church. It was made to look like the Round Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which was the greatest place in the Crusaders' world. Before the church was built in the middle of the 12th century, the Knights Templar in London met at a site in High Holborn in a building built by Hughes de Pions. And before that, the site had been a Roman temple in ancient Londinium. When the Crusaders took over Jerusalem in 1099, they gave the Dome of the Rock to the Augustinians, who turned it into a church. Back in England, the Knights Templar had a lot of power, and the Master of the Temple was a member of the Parliament. The Temple was also an early safe deposit bank. When the Crown tried to take the money of Knights and Lords who had put their money there, the Temple sometimes fought back. After the Knights Templar was destroyed and banned in 1307, King Edward II took over the church as a Crown property. Number 11. Accra. In May of 1291, the world shifted into a new epoch. Or maybe it would be better to say that Middle Ages ended since this was the month that the Crusaders lost control of the Middle East. The Siege of Accra was the most important event. Accra was the capital of the Crusader state of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Saladin, the great Muslim general, took the city of Jerusalem in 1187. The new city, Accra, was on the coast of the Mediterranean. It was a major trade center and a key nerve center for the Crusaders in the area. In 1291, though, it was attacked by a dangerous enemy called the Mamluk Sultanate. The Mamluks were slave warriors, descendants, who had been recruited or enslaved in places like the Balkans and East Asia. Over time, they became a strong military force in Islamic countries. The Mamluks carefully planned the siege, which started in April 1291. Accra was well protected by walls and towers, so they had to be very patient and organized. It also had strong defensive forces like the Teutonic Knights, the Knights Hospitaller, and the Knights Templar. The Mamluks, on the other hand, had a lot of soldiers and some terrifyingly siege machines. The constant attack wore down the troops until May 18th, when the Mamluks rushed into the city with the help of hundreds of camels carrying war drums that sounded like thunder. A lot of people were killed. In the chaos, women and children ran through the streets, trying to get on boats that were being hurriedly launched from the docks. Even though some Templars hid in a fortified part of the city and fought for a few more days, they were also finally beaten. Then, with Accra fallen, the Crusades came to an end in bloody defeat. Number 10. Grand Master's Palace, Rhodes In Rhodes, the Crusader Palace of the Grand Masters is a place that could just make you go a little crazy. The beautiful arches, huge rooms, impressive columns, and dark, mysterious undercrofts will please even the pickiest castle lover. But that's not all. Before it was even built, the Palace of the Grand Masters already had a long and interesting history. Before the first castle was built at the end of the 7th century, an old Greek temple called Helios stood there for hundreds of years. Rhodes was attacked over and over again, and its port activity and wealth grew. In 1309, the Knights of St. John and Jerusalem arrived and built a city there. The city got rich very fast leading to a big building program that quickly changed the old city into the magnificent place we know today. 
The palace was the Order of Knights of St. John's and later Masters' greatest achievement. It was a great example of their wealth and power. The knights ruled for 200 years until the Ottoman Turks took over in 1522 and turned the palace into a jail and barracks. In 1851 and 1856, earthquakes caused damage to the palace. When the Italians liberated Rhodes in 1912, they started a number of projects to fix up the palace, making it the gold standard tourist attraction it is today. Number nine, Croc des Chevaliers. Croc des Chevaliers is a castle in Syria. It was built for the Emir of Aleppo in 1031 current era, but the Knights Hospitaller bought it in 1144 CE and did a lot of work on it. It was the biggest crusader castle in the Middle East and a defense against the growth of Muslim states in the 12th and 13th centuries. It was almost impossible to attack. The castle is now on the list of World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. The Emir of Aleppo built the castle on the site of a much older fort. It's on a natural citadel near the coast of southern Syria between Tartus and Tripoli. After the Emir was, Raymond II of Tripoli gave the castle to the Knights Hospitalier in 1144. At its peak, the castle was home to about 2,000 people, including soldiers, crossbow experts, and freelancers. You ever think about where the word freelancer came from? It wasn't just people working for YouTube channels back then. It was people with huge lances, and they were willing to lance someone for some money, not for free. Number eight, Grandmaster's Palace, Valletta. Since the 1600s, Malta's government has been based in the Grandmaster's Palace in Valletta. The Knights Hospitaller of St. John moved into the Grandmaster's Palace in 1571. It was their home until 1798, when this religious and military order left Malta. The place was built in 1571 and was one of the first buildings in Valletta. Over time, different Grand Masters added to and changed the building as they saw fit. During British rule in the 19th century, the British rulers lived in the Grand Masters Palace. Since Malta gained its freedom in 1964, it has been the home of the House of Representatives. Today, the Grand Masters Palace is still a governmental building but parts of it are open to the public. The state rooms and the armory are two of these places. The richly designed state rooms have a lot of art pieces, some of which date back to the time of the Knights Hospitaller, like the Great Siege Frescoes by Matteo Perez de Leccio. Number seven, Carac Castle. Even though it was built by Crusaders in 1142, the history of the spot where Carac Castle stands goes back to almost the beginning of human history. After all, Jordan is one of the places where history as we know it started. In 1176, Reynold of Châtillon became Lord of Carac Castle after marrying Stephanie of Milly, who was Humphrey III of Tehran's widow. He chased camel battalions all over the place and even tried to attack Mecca because he wanted power. Saladin noticed this, of course. In 1183 AD, he laid siege to the castle but left when allied Christian troops from Jerusalem showed up. In 1184, he did the same thing, and after four weeks of siege, the same thing happened again. Finally, Saladin's nephew finally took Karak Castle in 1188 AD after a few failed tries. This was after Saladin's army beat a much larger crusader army at the Battle of Hattin in 1187 AD. This time, there was no one left to send the extra help to Karak Castle. Muslim forces cut off the castle's food and water, and a few months later, it gave up. Number six, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When you look at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre today, you can see all the marks of its long and interesting past. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is one of the most important places in Christianity because it contains what Christians believe to be Christ's last five stations before he was crucified. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built in 325 or 326 AD by Constantine I, who was the first Roman ruler to become a Christian. It is thought to be where Jesus was buried, so it is called the Sepulchre, which means tomb. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre has been destroyed and rebuilt many times over the years. Most of what you see now was built after the First Crusade in the 1100s. Number five, Citadel of Salah ed Din. The Citadel of Salah ed Din in Syria is an interesting example of a Crusader era fortress that has been maintained. The spot has been a fort for many centuries. It is thought that the Phoenicians 
and then Alexander the Great were the first people to stay there. The Byzantines built the palace we have now. It was a crusader fortress until Saladin took it over in 1188. It was taken over by the Byzantine Emperor John I Tsimiskis in 975. Around the year 1000, he built three walls five meters thick to protect it. The Byzantines ran it until about 1108. At that time, the Crusaders took it over. In 1188, the Ayyubid ruler Saladin and his son led one of the most successful military operations. They laid siege to the castle and took it. In the center of the site, later rulers built a house, a mosque, baths, a tank, and a madrasa. After the Mamluks attacked it in 1287, it was finally taken back, but it wasn't used again until at least the late 14th century. In 2006, UNESCO named it a World Heritage Site. Number four, Bodrum Castle. In 1402, the Crusader Knights Hospitaller built Bodrum Castle in Bodrum, Turkey, to defend against the Seljuk Turks who were trying to take over. Built to the best standards of the time, Bodrum Castle was an important haven for more than a century, giving Christians in Asia Minor a safe place to live. Since the Ottoman Sultanate was a threat to the Knights Hospitaller, who were based on the island of Rhodes, they knew they needed a spot on the mainland. The Grand Master of the Order found a good place for the Knights to build their new fort, in the port town of Bodrum, where a small Seljuk castle had stood in the 11th century. The German builder knight Heinrich Schlegelholt started building the fort in 1404. The Pope promised the workers who helped build it a place in heaven, so let's do it. The walls were finished in 1437, and the church was one of the first buildings built. The Spanish Knights of Malta later rebuilt it in the Gothic style. It's interesting that each nation of Knights Hospitaller got their own tower, built in their own style, based on their language and culture. Bodrum Castle also used a lot of statues and building materials made of stone from the nearby mausoleum of Masolus. When the Knights gave the castle to the Ottomans in 1522, the chapel was turned into a mosque and a minaret was added. However, French warship later damaged the minaret during World War I. Number three, Ajlun Castle. Ajlun Castle is a Muslim castle from the 12th century that is in the northwest of Jordan. It was ordered by Saladin and built by his nephew, Iz al-Din Usama. While the Crusaders in the Levant were playing cat and mouse with Saladin, his generals were getting ready for a war on their own terms. This war would destroy the Franks at the Battle of Hattin in 1187. As time passed, Muslim military defenses got stronger and Saladin worked hard to bring all Muslim troops together. During the wars between the Mongols and the Mamluk Kingdom, Ajlun also played a big role. The castle was taken over by the Mongol attackers, who did a lot of damage to it. The Mamluk Sultan Baibars took it back after the Mongols were defeated at the famous Battle of Ain Jalut, where the amazing Mongol progress was finally stopped. Later, when the Ottomans took over the area, Ajlun Castle did its role as a place of governance. This lasted until the 19th century, when an earthquake caused so much damage that it had to be abandoned. Number two, hand grenades from the Crusades. Clay pots have been found in Jerusalem for a long time by archaeologists. A new study shows that some of them were probably ancient hand grenades. Samples taken from inside a group of clay jars from the 11th and 12th centuries that were found in Jerusalem show that they may have explosive properties. Archaeologists previously thought that the objects were used to drink beer or hold mercury, oils, and medicines. But a new study says that some of them were early weapons that used explosives. During the Crusades, it was said that crude grenades were thrown at Crusader fortresses. People said that the devices made loud noises and flashed bright lights. Many scholars think that the jars may have held black powder, an explosive made in ancient China. But other experts say that this is not the case. Most historians think that black powder was brought to the Middle East and Europe in the 1200s. But the fact that these jars were made between the 9th and 11th centuries shows that black powder may have been brought to the Middle East much earlier. Number one, Christ's tomb. Christians have long thought that this is where the body of Jesus Christ was buried. The tomb is the most revered place in the Christian world. It's made up of a shelf or bed made of rock cut out of a cave's wall. At least since 1555 and probably for hundreds of years before that, the burial bed has been covered with marble cladding. 
This is supposed to stop visitors from stealing pieces of the original rock. The canonical Gospels, which are the first four books of the New Testament and thought to have been written around AD 30, have the oldest stories about how Jesus was buried. Even though the details are different, all of the stories say that Jesus was buried in a tomb cut out of rock that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, a rich Jewish friend of Jesus. The first time Muslims invaded in 638, Caliph Umar didn't want the church to be turned into a mosque, so he didn't pray there. This saved the church. 400 years of service went on without stopping. But in 1009, an Egyptian Fatimid king named Al-Hakim bin Amr Allah ordered the church and its holy tomb to be completely destroyed, even though his Christian mother and sister were upset about it. Within three years, the caliph gave in and let Christians rebuild the church. When the Crusaders showed up in 1099, they added more decorations and made the walls stronger. They added chapels, fenced in the Rock of Calvary, and built the Catholicon, a place of worship just east of the tomb. It was the best example of medieval engineering with amazing domes and illuminated ceilings. It set the shape of the church for the next 850 years. But over the ages, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has also been a source of deep and sometimes violent competition between Christians. What do you think drove people to go on the Crusades? Do you think any of these fascinating relics hold special powers? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now.